Uh, good evening. I welcome you to the last and main part of our uh, event, Professor uh, uh, Lowell Bergman's uh, uh, talk. Uh, I would first of all like to uh, ask the president of the university, Professor Yosef Klafter, to say a few words. Well, good evening, and uh, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, our distinguished guest, Professor Lowell Bergman uh, from Berkeley, the Dean of the Faculty of uh, Social Sciences, uh, the head of the school of, the, sorry, the department, not yet a school of communication, uh, faculty members, students, and guests. Uh, it's really a real pleasure to be here at uh, the first uh, Tel Aviv uh, communication conference. Uh, the conference uh, uh, actually uh, meant, is meant to provide a forum uh, for a broad range of discussions and perspectives exploring the role of media and communication in today's uh, society. This year, the conference is dedicated to the state and future of investigative uh, journalism, an issue of crucial importance, uh, especially in the interest of a just and democratic uh, society. Uh, without doubt, uh, during the day, you had panels and you had workshops, and I'm sure that you have discussed uh, the journalism's functions. And uh, tonight, we are honored to have with us, as I mentioned, Professor Lowell uh, Bergman, who will, I'm sure, elaborate on the themes of today's discussions. Now, during uh, the past year, the Department of Communication has undergone uh, a complete a transformation, primarily as a result of the dramatic changes taking place in the world of communication, uh, both in Israel and abroad, but also part of the university's restructuring. Uh, it's, it's really uh, departments, schools, and so on. And uh, so we are on the, on, I would say, on the start of a new, uh, of a new uh, journey. The School of Journalism, Koteret, has been incorporated into the department, and uh, here I would like really to thank the Dan David Foundation and Ariel David, who is here with us, for the support. And uh, the bachelor's uh, program has now uh, acquired also a practical uh, uh, track alongside with the, uh, I would say, traditional theoretically oriented uh, track. The theoretical courses have been modified, and they reflect the whole, uh, I would say, change uh, into the world of internet or internet uh, uh, revolution. A new laboratory of research on, of uh, online behavior uh, has been created. Uh, an online magazine has been also uh, uh, initiated, also named Coteret. And uh, I would say also that the location of the previous uh, uh, school, Coteret, is now renovated and it's a newsroom used by students and by, uh, for practical, uh, uh, I would say, trek. So overall, uh, we are really uh, going through some uh, really big changes and this already sh has, has an effect if we check it, the effect by the marked increase in the number of students who enrolled into the uh, departments of communication. So when I was approached recently in order to uh, 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 ask me for some support for this uh, type of conference, I immediately was bought into the idea, and this is actually an inauguration of a series of uh, uh, conferences that I hope will uh, happen uh, annually. So uh, I congratulate all the organizers, all those who came with good ideas, and uh, I wish you a fascinating evening, and thank you very much, Danny. I would like to uh, ask uh, the Dean, Professor uh, <coughs> Ronan Rosenbaum, to say a few words. Shalom and good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to host you here in our beautiful university, at the Faculty of Social Science, and with the Department of Communication, with the wonderful leadership of Danny Doe. Uh, good evening to our distinguished guests and all of you. And as Yossi said, I think we are going to start a new tradition. And the changes um, our president mentioned is only the beginning. 
because we have lots of more surprise we are planning uh, for our future. I think that if we look at the changes that the Department of Communication overgone, we can see in a way a metaphor to what our uh, society has gone from. Uh, when I was a young social worker at a mental health community center, we had a problem of adolescents who committed suicide, and as the press mentioned it, we used to see a wave of many more uh, trials to commit suicide. So we organized all the policemen, the journalists, the reporter, everyone, and asked them not to report of this event. And in a short time, we had the feeling that we were able to stop this trial to commit suicide from becoming some phenomena that everyone tried to imitate it. What we did 35 years ago could never be happened today. If we look at the changes of reporter journalism, communication, from a time that the role was mainly to convey knowledge, like in teaching, like uh, in education, like teachers, like lecturer, we've all changed our role completely. We now, the most important role now is not to convey knowledge because everyone it can get and know the knowledge, but we can look at communication as influence, the way the knowledge transfer, or as designer of what is going on. And I think communication now has a much larger influence on our day-to-day -day life. I don't think any of us can stay for a year without being connected to anything, learning what is going on, what people think of everything, uh, how things change. Changes are very fast, and we all use all this communication style. This made lots of changes at the university because I think our role now as a department of communication is to make sure that we educate and train a real responsible people who can be responsible for the kind of knowledge we transfer, for, for the way we influence society, for learning how to investigate things, and to know that actually we are very important figures in what is going on in society. I'm therefore very happy to the changes the Department of Communication has gone through. I think we have a lot to expect in the future. I think you all have been a big part of what we are doing and a wonderful example for the link between theory and practice, research and field, and I think we cannot anymore separate those because in the past we can talk about theory uh, in compare with practice, but we can't do it anymore. In our teaching of theory, we influence the practice. In training people, we influence the knowledge. And I think this is our responsibility as university. So I welcome everyone. I hope to see all of you next year in this conference. And I wish you a good evening. Thank you. All right, now I have two pleasurable tasks. Uh, it's a pretty good situation. First of all, I would like to uh, thank quite a lot of people uh, who've um, been very helpful um, with, with constructing this, uh, this conference. Um, the president of the university, Professor Klafter, Vice President uh, Amos Elad, the dean, Professor Ronen Rosenbaum, uh, the university's research authority and the Dan David Foundation especially uh, all for their contribution and support for this conference. Uh, I would like to thank Avner Hofstein and El Adman, uh, who've been working with me on this conference for uh, over a year now. Thank you guys, are you here? Where are you? Thank you guys for, for all the good work. Uh, my, colleagues, my colleagues at the department um, uh, who've been working on this conference, Dudu Gilboa and, and uh, Shira Dvir, Jérôme Bourdon, Tamara Shuri, Sandrine Boudana, 
our uh, wonderful uh, administrative assistants, uh, Orit Dan, Sabrina Unger, uh, Ronit Frumer, uh, all the good, good people at the social science um, faculty, um, uh, Rina Brook, Michal Rokach, Yossi Shalom, and many others, um, Orna Cohen, the university's spokesman, uh, Eudor and Alon Weinpress, the marketing people who've been very, very helpful in this process, our website editor, uh, Itai Ziv, uh, our students, Limor Ziv and Adar Moran, and Natan Stoleri, and not, uh, Yonatan Ochayon, Shani Giladi, many, many people have been involved in this uh, uh, enterprise, uh, and I think that uh, we can all be um, um, satisfied and, and happy uh, with the result. The, the discussions were uh, fascinating, the workshops were good, um, and uh, we're now looking for the best part of the day uh, with, uh, with um, uh, Professor Bergman's um, uh, talk. Uh, Professor Bergman is uh, currently uh, the chair of investigative reporting at the Graduate School of Journalism at UC um, uh, Berkeley. Uh, he's the director of the investigative reporting uh, program. Um, and this is something that Professor Bergman has been doing for quite a few years now, uh, after many, many years, and while also uh, doing investigative working for more than 40 years now um, for uh, frontline uh, PBS, uh, 60, man 60 minutes, um, a, a very, very long list of uh, wonderful achievements. Um, um, in, this, in this type of work. Uh, investigative journalism is a sort of, um, is a way of living. Uh, it's, it's, it's a sort of uh, a form of art. And I think there's nobody who embodies this way of living uh, better than uh, Professor Bergman. Um, it may be um, a problem um, about our society uh, that the thing that impresses most um, um, a lot of people when I tell them about Professor Bergman, uh, is that Al Pacino has played him in a movie. Um, but still, even, that's, even if that's a, a problem about us still, I don't think anybody else in this room has been played by Al Pacino. So that's quite <laughs> um, uh, a big deal. Uh, but Professor Bergman has also uh, won many Emmys, the Pulitzer Prize, uh, the um, silver and golden baton awards, three Peabody's, and more and more, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the individuals who've taught us most about what investigative journalism is, how to do it, how to do it um, um, fully, uh, totally, paying the price when you need to, and always coming up on top with wonderful, important stories about people who have too much power in their hands, using it for things uh, for purposes that are not our purposes. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome to uh, the stage Professor Lowell Bergman. Well, good evening. Uh, and thank you, um, Professor Klafter and Dean Rosenbaum and Danny and Avner and Orit for inviting me and getting me here with my wonderful wife, Sharon, who's somewhere back there in the audience. Um, and so, just to make it clear, though to some of you who may be here, I'm not Al Pacino. And, and so if you thought he was showing up, you can leave now. Um, and everyone always asks me, what's it like to be played by Al Pacino? And the problem is, is that it's a kind of out-of-body experience uh, when you see someone using your name on stage who's older than you are, uh, shorter, and Italian. Um, and I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground this evening. Um, I understand you're going to possibly watch the film later, so it's a pretty long film, um, and leave some time for questions. And let me say that uh, Lately, uh, now that I'm um, uh, past my 70th birthday, I started to reflect a lot about everything in life, and particularly nearly a half century uh, doing this kind of work. Um, and when I do that, it, it, it tells me that I've been not only incredibly lucky, uh, in part lucky doing this in a, a country whose uh, traditions go back to the early 18th century in terms of talking back to power. 
and surviving and providing at least a legal basis for protecting you from the consequences of doing that. And it's only because of that, I think, that I was able to survive in this business starting uh, when I first joined with some friends of mine and created a weekly newspaper in San Diego, California in 1969. Uh, and I think I'm going to recount a little bit of that experience because in talking with journalists here in Israel, both before I came and while I've been here, I've been told that there's a bit of malaise, something called Netanyahu fatigue, um, around the subject of power, influence, and money. And if time permits, I'm going to try to tell my own personal story that I call the tale of two Adelsons. They are not relatives. And focus on that question of why it's important to know where all that money comes from and what it may tell you. But first I wanted to, to uh, reflect briefly on the theme of this, of this gathering, which was the state of investigative reporting, and, and tell you enthusiastically that there is a worldwide renaissance going on in the practice of investigative reporting. This is not just because it's the 40th anniversary, by the way, of the movie All the President's Men, or that Hollywood decided recently to give two Oscars to a brilliant film, Spotlight. If you haven't seen it, it's really the story, the nitty gritty story of an investigative team at a major newspaper that took on entrenched pow pri private power, the Roman Catholic Church. It's those lessons of taking on power that I think are now infused in a renaissance that's actually going on all around the world. In some ways, what's, uh, investigative reporting is more difficult than it used to be because there aren't as many financial resources, but in many ways it's being powered by the fact that it's a lot easier to get information and for us to communicate. Just in the general sense of um, uh, the news business, uh, 17, 16 years ago in 9-11, the networks in the United States were laying off um, and closing all their foreign bureaus. Uh, and that practice actually continued, well it was reversed briefly after 9-11 and then continued. But it's the development of the, of the World Wide Web and the internet and websites that we now know we can communicate around the world instantaneously and have more access to information than ever before. And, that's and that goes as well, not just for newspapers. I go back to the days when the only way you could get access to a newspaper's files was to physically go there and be given little envelopes in what was called the morgue. And these envelopes were filled with clippings and if you were lucky enough to have a friend, you could get to them. But otherwise, there was no internet to go to, no library, no place where you could do a thorough background before you started reporting. Now, what has happened, though, as a result of 9-11 and terrorism and the rise of it, is that the political atmosphere around doing certain kinds of investigative reporting in, in, in and particularly as it relates to unaccountable private power, has gotten more difficult. What was happening at that moment was an international movement towards policing, bribery, corruption, and money laundering that had never had no precedence in my experience. Much of that is being reversed, and much of that has, has led to my conviction that those of us who are in the world of investigative reporting need to continue to emphasize bringing private power to, ac to account. Now when I get depressed and lament a lot of the things that we've lost or the battles that don't go our way, I reflect back to what was going on 47 years ago in this business when we started that little newspaper in San Diego. At that time, Back in those days, very few established news organizations were doing any 
in-depth public interest reporting. In a place like San Diego, hard by the Mexican border, in that corner of the United States where it was a center of the military effort in Vietnam, the local media was terrible. And for people like us starting a, a, a new newspaper, trying to explain and explicate what was going on in San Diego, meant that we could, we, we could do stories because they were just hiding in plain sight. We learned quickly that very few people were working in the area of exposing exactly what was going on and why things were happening. So when I look back to that period of time, both where I was in San Diego and nationally in the United States, there were only two and a half television networks in those days. We called ABC almost a broadcasting corporation. It had a 15 minute newscast and occasional documentaries. And the only difference between it and the other networks, for instance, in broadcasting, was they had reached out to 30 minutes and a couple of more documentaries. News programming wasn't what it is today. Information wasn't avail available. And the, and the newspapers in general treated people like the rich and the, the rich and the powerful the same way they treated athletes on the sports pages. There was very little in the way of what we would call critical reporting being done by the establishment news media. Most of it, in fact, in those days was done by freelancers. And that's been forgotten in the history when, we, when it's told by news organizations. It was individual freelance writers doing books who brought the, da the damage to the environment or auto safety or poverty or in fact the mass murders in Vietnam by American troops. People who, brought, who did those stories. It wasn't the newspapers, it wasn't television, it was individuals and to a certain extent a growing group of alternative newspapers. Where I started out in San Diego, we quickly discovered that we had oligarchs, in, the, in that sense, controlling the town. When we started looking at who ran the city and county of San Diego, we came across the fact that Mr. San Diego of the century, the man who held that title, the leading banker in town, C. Arnold Smith, had a conglomerate that controlled everything from the tuna fleet to all the, the taxi companies in the southwestern United States to the San Diego Padres baseball team, and that he was in partnership with Mr. San Diego of the Year, who was also the Lord of Tijuana across the border, and whose brother was in the La Cosa Nostra, the Mafia. This was all happening and not being reported in the newspapers or in television. And so we began to do just that. The result was to get us a lot of attention. The kind of literary criticism that included firebombing, arrests, the destruction of our uh, newspaper office, uh, and constant um, uh, pressure to literally get out of town. But I lived long enough through that to become aware of the importance of this work and the fact that at first, if you don't succeed, potentially the political situation will change, and you will. In the end, two to three years after we started publishing, Mr. San Diego of the Century had been indicted. His partner had been sent to jail. The city council had been indicted for bribery and corruption. And we had been vindicated, although we had left town. But I did have one other story and one other thing that I learned during that time, which, is, which led to another kind of consequence, a consequence that stayed with me to this day. We discovered in investigating who ran the city and, where, and, and who owned it, that one of the major lenders in the northern part of the, of the county was something called the Teamsters Central States Pension Fund. We didn't know what it was. It took some reading to figure it out. And we, and we learned that it was, in fact, controlled by organized crime. 
we found that there was a relationship between the two individuals we focused on and what was called traditional organized crime. And after I left San Diego, oh, by the way, I should show you a little PowerPoint thing, if I can bring it up. Um, by that time, by the way, the work that we had done in San Diego did make, did get some national attention. So I'll give you a little, I'm not Al Pacino, but am I, if this will, oh, didn't work. It's a little test. Guess which, guess which one is me. So, in the saga of what happened to us in San Diego finally did make it to the national media. And then after that, after after the resolution of what happened to the two individuals in question, <clears throat> a partner and I uh, from those days, a man named Jeff Gerth, who went on to work for the New York Times for 30 years, did a story in uh, a magazine that no longer exists, Penthouse Magazine. Oh, there we go. Didn't. What's the. Okay, thank you. So we did this article thinking that all we were doing was using public records to show that the people who owned most of northern San Diego County and had funded a country club and, how, and luxury development who had connected to organized crime, that these, this particular group of people out of Las Vegas were well known to US authorities as members of organized crime, or fronts for organized crime groups in, at coming out of Las Vegas. To our surprise, and it happened one day when I was driving down Highway 1, if you know it, in, in, in uh, California. Um, actually, in those days, I lived up in Berkeley, and I was coming down, going down south on the highway, listening, in, listening to the all-news radio station at the time. This is 1975 about six months after the article came out. And the lead story was that the owners of this country club, a man named Mervyn Adelson, uh, no relationship to Sheldon, um, and a man named Morris Dalitz, Mo Dalitz, a man who was well known as a partner of Meyer Lansky, had decided to sue us for $630 million. And at that point I was swerved off the highway hearing my name on the radio. Little did I know, because I'd never been sued before, that this would be an experience that would go on for 10 years. That despite the fact that over that period of time, we would win motions, have a trial, have the case thrown out a number of times, they would appeal and it would be reinstated. And they would deny under oath that everything we were saying about them was was simply libelous and not true. Finally, 10 years after the litigation started, we agreed to settle the matter, not with money, but with letters in which we said things about them like they were great philanthropists and supporters of Israel, by the way. And it went away. But it sat in the back of my mind all those years, how could that have happened? How could someone sue and know that what, know, know that what was published was true. How could they do that? And why was it that they were successful in the end? Because afterwards, no one ever published any of those allegations again. They went on, Mr. Adelson went on to become the second largest shareholder in Time Warner. For a number of years, the husband of Barbara Walters, spend a night in the White House when Bill Clinton was in power and be known as a big man around Hollywood. In 2000, I found out 
and heard that in the dot-com bubble, he had overextended himself and had gone bankrupt. I didn't send him any letters of condolence, but he just simply disappeared until, until two years ago, Let's see if we got, yeah. Vanity Fair magazine did a story just prior to the Oscars. They do an annual story about the Oscars. And they went looking for him because this movie tycoon, this man who was, uh, was well-known in Hollywood, had simply disappeared for years. Then in his mid-80s, uh, fatally ill, actually, Merv Adelson gave them an interview. And at the very beginning of the, that meeting with the reporter, he said to him, I want to talk about the handshake relationship I had with the mob and how organized crime was the ticket to his success, how he had profited off of those relationships, despite the fact that he had denied it all those years, and that by suing, he had been successful in cleaning up his image and stopping the press from continuing to reveal anything about his past. That, that article struck me, in that, and that confession struck me in a way that I haven't been able to forget since I, I read it. It emphasized, emphasized to me the importance in our work of trying to determine when people appear on, this, uh, on, the, on, on our radar who have great wealth and political power, the definition really in some countries of oligarchs, that when they, that it's our obligation to take a long, hard look at where their money came from. It's, we are probably the last place in the society left where that kind of examination can take place. Many news organizations will shy away from doing it. You know, news organizations like to do good stories generally, but they don't like to do stories where there's pushback where the consequences aren't positive, where you don't get awards. And, and that, by the way, underscores the, story, the, the, the movie you may be watching later, The Insider. That's a, that's a situation where we had an exclusive story where part of it actually, because it didn't run, resulted in a news organization getting the Pulitzer Prize after we folded our, our cards. Those kinds of situations happen quite often because your bosses don't want to deal with the consequences. The consequences can tie you up. The consequences can, in the United States, they haven't resulted in anyone losing their lives in a number of years, but they're not necessarily physical, but it can be the end of your career. So taking those kinds of risks is something that you have to learn how to do and you have to learn how to get a new a, a publisher or a broadcaster to stand behind you. It doesn't happen all the time. And what happened with the first Mr. Adelson in my life is a clear example of what goes on and what people are willing to do in order to change the nature of the truth. Now, I know that if there are reporters in the room, that one of the reasons you don't like to go to, to gatherings like this and you don't like to uh, sit, sit through them is that you normally don't get any new information, you don't get any leads, you don't get it, you don't, people don't share. But in this case, I thought, that that I would get into the the story of Sheldon Adelson only because I know he's of interest here in in Israel for many obvious reasons, and because the question becomes, why does he have so much power? Who is he, and why should we care? In my case. I didn't know who he was. He wasn't a relative of Merv Adelson. Um, 
and he wasn't, he wasn't particularly on my radar. I wasn't doing stories in Las Vegas. But about 10 years ago, a source of mine who became an executive in, in Macau, the Chinese gambling capital of Macau, and I met, and he began telling me a story that not only surprised me, but I found it at first hard to believe. Macau is a, 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 ten, a city with a long history from the, from the 16th century, well, the 17th century on. It was a Portuguese colony. It was known over the centuries as a place where you, a vice capital of the region. And until 2000, remained a Portuguese colony when it was handed over to China, just like Hong Kong had been handed over. At that time, Macau was the gambling capital of Southeast Asia. All of the gambling casinos in Macau were owned and operated by one man. That monopoly changed when the Chinese government took over. And they allowed foreign companies and solicited US companies to bid on concessions Various Las Vegas companies put in bids for concessions. Some didn't because Macau's reputation was that its casinos were actually run by Chinese organized crime, known as triads. They are the largest organized criminal groups in the world. And so when the US companies, which are licensed in Nevada, one of which was Las Vegas Sands, Mr. Adelson's company, contemplated going into Macau, they were very hesitant. They hired experts to figure out who was who, and would they get in trouble, and would it endanger their licenses. They hesitated for a couple of years after, their, after these concessions were granted. Finally, one of them, Sheldon Adelson, jumped in. He bet $300 million on building a mega casino in downtown Macau. And when it opened, 80,000 people came the first day. They tore the doors off the place. Within a year, he had paid it off. And everyone else began jumping in to what became the largest gambling capital in the world, with revenue seven times that of Las Vegas. Now, in order to do that, in order to run a successful operation in Macau, there were a number of hurdles that Mr. Adelson and the other operators had to go through. The first one was that while gambling was, while the Chinese Communist government allowed gambling to continue and prostitution to continue in Macau, it was illegal in the rest of China. And you couldn't collect gambling debts anywhere in China in court, especially in court. You couldn't even advertise in China. So how do you get people to come to your casino? How do you collect debts if they get credit? And by the way, how do you get them to bring money to Macau? Because Macau, China has very strict currency controls. You can only bring $3,000 a day out of the country into Macau or out of China, period. That's the law. The way that changed, the way that, the way that the model that was adopted by all of the new casino operat operators was the same model that existed prior to them opening their doors in Macau. They did business with companies called junket companies that brought the, the high rollers, the most profitable side of the business, to their casinos. Now, how did these people collect debts? And these people, by the way, guaranteed the debts of the gamblers and took care of recruiting them. With, within almost instantaneously, they, were, they made 60 to 70 percent of the revenue for, Mr. for all the American casinos that operated, including Mr. Adelson's. Who ran these companies? Who were these people? Well, the person who I was talking with said, we know who they are. Just no one is talking about it. No one's written about it, and no one is investigating. One of them, for example, 
was identified is this was identified in a U.S. Senate report in 1992 as a senior leader of the Wohapto Triad. Chung Chi Tai is his name. Here's a photograph of him. So, back in Berkeley at the investigative reporting program where we have staff reporters, one of them, my, my colleague then, Matt Isaacs, and I decided to investigate what was going on and could you find documentation that in fact these relationships existed. And what resulted was an article in Reuters in March of 2010 that detailed, in de detailed with documentation that Sands China, Sheldon Adelson's company, was in business with Chung Chi Tai, that he was the guarantor of $125 million in Hong Kong dollars in credit arrangements for gamblers at the casino. Now later we would find out a lot more. We also found a trial transcript in which Mr. Mr. Chung was identified not only as a triad leader but the man who had organized a conspiracy to kill one of the gamblers and dismember his partner who had won a lot of money at Sands China. We called Sands and asked them for comment, they didn't reply. The article was published. It was big news in Southeast Asia, didn't make much of a ripple back here, back in the US or in Israel. But But it did get a, what we call in the business, here's the article. This is the article. And then it got this kind of reaction, this letter from lawyers representing Mr. Adelson in Las Vegas Sands demanding a retraction. Now, and threatening to sue us and denying that they had any connection whatsoever with triads, organized crime, or Chung Chi Tai. After that, we heard nothing. There was no lawsuit. There were no more letters. There was no response. But something very unusual happened six months later. Six months later, a lawsuit was filed, a lawsuit that normally you wouldn't take too much uh, notice of, uh, brought against Las Vegas Sands by the former head of Adelson's operations in Macau, a man named Steve Jacobs. And in that lawsuit, he provided us with well, information about the company's reaction to the story. This is something you rarely, if ever, have the experience of that ever happens. In, in, that, in this lawsuit is a description of how the company ran around, basically, and tried to figure out a way of getting us not only to retract, but also to deny what they, through their own internal investigation, determined was true. Now, they didn't sue, it turned out, because they commissioned reports, they did their own investigations, and their general counsel opined in writing that that before they filed a lawsuit, they'd better check all their facts because it may not be, it may not turn out the way they want it. He then de describes in his lawsuit why he got fired, which is that he wanted to end the relationship with organized crime. That lawsuit continues today. And that man, Steve Jacobs, in the last five and a half to six years has been trying to bring this case to trial. It's going to get to trial in June of this year. So for those of you who are interested in Mr. Adelson, the source of his money, 
and um, public testimony about that, you may be seeing it soon. Here I'm going to give you an excerpt and I don't, uh, from a story we did for uh, NBC's Meet the Press, a piece of footage we found of Mr. Jacobs testifying in a, a deposition, in a pretrial deposition in, in Florida after Sheldon Adelson also sued him for defamation. That suit was thrown out. And here's what he had to say about these allegations. Oh no, that's, that's Sheldon denying it. So. Right here. We have no intention and will not do things that violate any law. He said he saw no proof that triads operated junkets to his Macau casino and that Jacob's plan to stop junkets to his casino would have financially decimated the enterprise. This was insanity. He purposely tried to kill the company. Adelson said ongoing federal investigations brought on by Jacob's allegations He's squealed like a pig squeals. Will soon vindicate him. Okay. So I did this backwards. Here is Jacob what, said in a deposition that he was fired from his job after he objected to what he called the casino's illicit business practices. Did I report the activities of some of the specific allegations where Sheldon Adelson was personally involved in wrongdoing, illegal and or immoral activities? You bet. That's about the only thing that Mr. Uh, Jacobs has said in public related to these allegations. In, in a sworn testimony that's now public uh, in the last five and a half years. The reason that it's taken five and a half years is that Mr. Adelson's lawyers have been held, uh, have been sanctioned repeatedly by a judge in Las Vegas uh, for delaying the case. He's gone through five major law firms who resigned during that period of time. And the case also has become a federal criminal investigation which the government sources say an announcement of the settlement of the case should come any day now. So one message I'm bringing to you, I guess, tonight is that uh, the story around Mr. Adelson, where his money has come from, that money which has influenced Israel in so many different ways, particularly the media here, is something that should be in the headlines relatively soon. And and it raises a question, a question we, re we had many, many years ago in my career of the importance of knowing where this private power comes from. What is the source when it can have influence over issues of public importance? Now, I, I was I'm going to just say one more thing about the state of the media and what we're doing in Berkeley. When I, when I was, um, when I was at, uh, in the networks from 1978 to almost 1997, um, one of the, at ABC and then at 60 Minutes, one of the things I noticed was that all the executives in the networks every morning would pick up, the, pick up newspapers, read them, and then figure out what stories they were going to put pictures in. Or if they did a story like on 60 Minutes on a Sunday, what, what they were really interested in was, was their story going to be in the newspaper the next day? And I realized that one of the things we could do was collaborate. One of the things we could probably do is do a story for broadcast and also do it for print at the same time if we were willing to cross that line between news organizations. One of the great things that's happened over the last 15 years and with the collapse of the newspaper model is that traditional established news organizations are now 
collaborating. And that collaboration has in turn, I think, increased the, the number of investigative stories, their power, their heft, and involved more young people than ever before. At Berkeley, we've worked on the idea of involving our students, in this case mostly graduate students, in in-depth investigative stories as they're happening. And what that has done is, cre is help create a new generation of investigative reporters. It's a, it's a new model of having a news organization based at a university, but it's resulted in us not only winning awards, but also in getting major philanthropic backing and finding out more recently that there's increasing interest out there in the commercial uh, world in investment in quality nonfiction uh, material and content. Content is becoming king out there in the world of, of uh, the media. And in the future, in order to finance our operations, and I think you'll see this increasingly, there's going to be a development of more private sources of, uh, for, for this kind of work in the years to come. You can see it in Amazon and Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post and the difference in what's happening with that organization. You can see it in streaming media uh, and Netflix and what's going on in the documentary film world. And so for the first time since the advertising model started to deteriorate over a decade ago, we're starting to see the possibilities combined with nonfiction investig non nonprofit investigative reporting groups that are popping up all over the place. Um, a revitalization of this kind of reporting, a renaissance, if you will, and a, and a, a possibility that we can actually keep this type of work going in the future. Thank you. Are, are there any questions or anybody in, in the back? Well, I think one of the, the first question really the, with in this example of Mr. Adelson, and it's not just him, by the way, I mean, in the, in the Macau, uh, to be fair to him, in the Macau situation, everyone was doing the same thing. And it wasn't until um, the fall of 2014 that the Chinese government, in reaction to the flow of hundreds of billions of dollars out of China through Macau, and what it saw as the corruption of the, of the leadership of the Communist Party, as well as uh, executives in state-owned industries gambling away money in Macau, cracked down. And so as a sort of a fact check to this whole idea of what kind of business, where was the source of the money to the casinos in Macau, because of that crackdown in the fall of 2014, Macau revenues plummeted by 40%. Um, Steve Wynn's company stock value went down 75%. Sheldon's company was halved. He actually lost on paper $12 billion in one year. Um, he's gotten a couple of billion back. He's, he's at about 22 billion now uh, in personal wealth. So. Uh, the fact of this business model was hiding in plain sight, which is what I found uh, 
really interesting. The fact that the U.S. government, for example, didn't seem to care. The fact that Nevada gaming regulators weren't asking questions. So part of what's happened is, in this particular instance, is that, and, and by the way, when we would go to Macau or Hong Kong and ask people about all of this, they would say, as a newspaper editor in Macau said, said to me, there are triads meaning gangsters. There are triads in the casinos? Of course. So it was considered that's the way business is done. And why hasn't any, anything more happened about it? It's somewhat perplexing to me, except that our attention, that is our government's attention and our, our, the attention of the media in general, has been elsewhere. And the idea of looking deeply into the way money is made it takes effort, takes time, and can have consequences. And that's the only way I can explain it. And no one has raised that question, as far as I know, in, uh, in all of the electoral coverage related to uh, him having, for instance, this sort of bake-off where all the Republican candidates would come to his casino. Um, trying to get contributions. No one has raised these questions. To hit with him, if they get him on camera or do a, a print interview with him, or, or in general, it's just not done. Now, you may know the, the story of, of the Las Vegas Review Journal, for instance, that just happened. Um, Mr. Adelson not only now own, owns two newspapers, at least two newspapers now, not just the one in Israel that's free, but he decided to buy, apparently through his son-in-law, the Las Vegas Review Journal, the largest daily newspaper in Nevada. Again, like Israel Hayam, he's claiming he wasn't involved. This was his son-in-law. Uh, I guess here he says it's his daughter who owns the newspaper. Um, but um, it, it has turned out that in part, as it, uh, as it was revealed, that prior to the actual purchase, the then owners uh, assigned three reporters to start looking at judges in Nevada. Well, one of the judges they were assigned to monitor was the judge in the Jacobs case, who had been issuing rulings that Sheldon Adelson wasn't, didn't like, because he may finally have to go to trial. So that kind of behavior has happened. There haven't been any consequences, really, except for some media outrage over the use of a newspaper to possibly investigate a judge in a case of importance to your prospective buyer. Um, but how do I explain all of this going down and not more of more coverage? I don't. Yeah. Okay, well, um, to start at the beginning, how does the money come out and go back in? Um, a couple of things. One is, uh, it becomes clear once you start looking at Macau that you get a good idea of why the Chinese economy is in trouble. And that is that um, China operates with a shadow banking system. Money moves around in China, not through, it, there are regular banks, but it doesn't operate the same way. If you want to move money out of the country, if you're Chinese, there are a number of ways to do it without the government knowing anything about it and getting around the currency controls. This is a method that's usually open to people with great wealth and as opposed to the average person who's trying to just cross the border. So in the way that the junket system operated, for instance, with the uh, casinos, 
the junket companies would literally open up a gambling office inside the casino, which was also a private gambling room. It, it looks inside, like, it has it like its own cage, its own bank teller thing. It's like a little bank. And your money shows up there when you want to move it. It's actually just a transfer that's done like a Hawala system. Uh, and there it is, magically. And collections of the actual cash are done by the junket representatives back in China. They're, they operate with almost like an Amway type system where they have like people in every neighborhood. So it goes all the way down to the block and, to the, uh, and uh, throughout the country. Um, but for example, if you don't want to deal with the junket system or you, you don't want to uh, deal with those people and make your own arrangements to go to Macau. Now this was until the crackdown in October. There were two major ways you could get your money in. One was you had a Chinese, China has one debit card called the Union Pay Card. It's a nationally owned card. You would take that debit card with you to Macau and, you, and you'll see that, that, that Macau is filled with jewelry stores. Rolex, it has, it sells, the, on paper, it sells the most Rolex watches of any place in the world. And what happens is you walk into the, the, uh, the, the, the watch store and you tell the person, I want a Rolex watch, it may be $50,000. They swipe your union pay card for the $50,000 watch. You then, you sign the receipt. You then give them the watch back and they deduct 3% and give you cash and you take that cash into the casino. That's one way. The other way, which actually we captured on film but I can't show you yet, um, is that just before you got to the, the, the border with Macau, like the border with Hong Kong, it looks like an international border. And you go through, and you're, you have to have a visa to get through if you're a Chinese citizen. And the government controls those. But just before you got to the, to the turnstile, to the booths at the border, there's an underground mall. And you walk up to these escalators that go down. And there are tables throughout this underground mall. And, and they look like tables that are selling accessories for iPhones, um, uh, cheap watches, and so on. Actually, if you look closely, you'll see that on each, table, each one of these tables, there are calculators. And what these are are money laundering places. And you can walk in with any amount of money. This is Chinese renminbi, yuan. You put it on the table. And actually, I tried, I only had uh, 10,000 renminbi, and so they didn't want to deal with me. That's about almost $2,000 US. Um, they said, I said, well, I wanted to experiment because uh, I was a Chinese, I was an American businessman operating in China. How much would be a good experiment? They said 50,000 US to start. The guarantee that they would, they would deliver uh, that amount of money minus their commission, which they said is less than the banks, uh, in my, either to my hotel room or to the cage in the VIP room uh, within 15 minutes of the transaction. So those two ways of operating, the estimates were that 40 billion went through the Rolex watch jewelry system a year, and another 40 billion went through the underground mall. But uh, the overall calculation in when Macau had reached its height in, in March of 2014 was that over a trillion dollars a year was bet in, the, in, in Macau. Um, and hundreds of billions were leaving. There were both State Department and local Macau government estimates that hundreds of billions of dollars US were leaving China through Macau every year. So you can imagine, that this is like a huge sort of uh, outflow of funds through this shadow banking system. Uh, in Berkeley, California, every year we have an annual symposium and in investigative reporting. I invite all of you to show up April 1st. It starts April 1st this year, and it runs for two and a half days. And usually we, uh, we on a Friday night, we um, uh, premiere some investigation that we're doing. 
And one year, we premiered our Macau investigation. And we had on the stage the former head of criminal intelligence for the Royal Hong Kong Police. Uh, we, all, we had, oh, I have some video of him, I think, somewhere, a Chinese gangster. Uh, was supposed to show up, but uh, unfortunately he got arrested. Uh, and, uh, and so he phoned in from jail. Um, and uh, we had David Barboza of the New York Times, who was their Sh Shanghai bureau chief and chief and sort of um, business correspondent in China. And a man named Jim Chanos, a well-known uh, short seller in the United States, the man who uh, had figured out that Enron was really an illegal operation and bet against it and made billions. And Chanos, we had interviewed Chanos and Chanos uh, agreed to come on the stage to say that up until 2011 he was a big uh, investor in, in Macau casino stocks until he started to have his people research this business model. And he had determined that this business model, in his opinion, was a violation of U.S. money laundering laws that in other th aspects of uh, what was going on, by the way, uh, in Macau, you had to violate U.S. anti-bribery laws to be in business. And he sold all his stock and was shorting all the Macau stocks and all of China, actually. Um, for saying that and mentioning the name Steve Wynn, along with uh, Las Vegas Sands in his remarks, he was sued four months later by Steve Wynn. This is the first time for defamation, this is the first time in the history of the University of California that anyone has ever been sued for what they said at an academic uh, meeting. And uh, in California we have very good libel defense laws and so the lawsuit was thrown out after uh, three months and then he appealed, he went back with a second try with the judge and lost again and is now uh, on appeal in the Ninth Circuit because he, the judge has now ordered that he has to pay everybody's legal fees, Mr. Wynn. Um, but that's the kind of pushback that you get or warnings you get um, when you get into these kinds of areas with this kind of business. Uh, so there are, there are basically three ways that it works. The junket system uh, is those companies are now going out of business, literally. Uh, the gangsters involved, Mr. Mr. Chung uh, is now, has now been uh, literally, he's been sort of charged and is out on bail uh, for laundering 250 million U.S. Uh, in violation of Chinese laws in, in a case in Hong Kong. Um, and other organizations have simply gone out of business. So the Chinese government has brought a stop to much of this activity. Uh, although some of the Rolex watch stuff and the underground wall is still there. You can, so the government knows what's going on. The government monitors all of this. It's a different world. It's not a, uh, and that's one of the, one of the uh, explanations you'll get from the companies involved. They'll say, well, the Chinese government knows all of this, so, you know, why shouldn't we do it? Yeah. Um, well, you, you, I ha had a whole series of uh, things here to, to show you, maybe at some other, uh, maybe I'll leave them behind, but um, there's a couple of things to understand before you see, if you're going to see the movie. It's a movie, it's not a documentary. That's first. The second, it is um, emotionally and in a sense politically honest and right on the money. And there are certain things in there like the meeting with the general counsel of, of CBS that are almost spot on in terms of word for word what happened. Um, in terms of Jeffrey Wigand, he comes to our annual symposium in Berkeley. Um, he survived. If, if, there was a, um, if there was a reason for me to do what I did related to CBS uh, after the story was killed, it was because, you know, I've had, uh, first of all, I've put um, 
CIA agents, mafia, mafia members, all kinds of people, snitches, I was going to show you a couple of them if you want to see them, uh, on camera and in stories on the record. But never been able to put a, until Jeffrey Wigand, a Fortune 500 executive who had signed confidentiality agreements on camera. But more importantly, I think, for as a journalist, what happened in that case was that the executives at CBS, who at, at 60 Minutes, who had been, who knew about what I was doing, everybody knew what I was doing with Wigan, because I won't get into all the litigation background, but it's tobacco industry, A, there's tobacco industry at that time, it's not in the movie, had sued CBS, um, and six months before I met Wigan, collected $3 million in a libel judgment in Chicago, Brown and Williamson Tobacco. And second, when you see the seven dwarfs say, uh, that's the seven CEOs in front of Congress who say, I believe that nicotine is not addictive. One of them is James Tisch, the son of Larry Tisch, because the Tisch family owned Lorillard Tobacco, and they also owned CBS. So that, the, the background of this was that when they say they're killing the story, the problem, and that's for me in that situation, it's their company, it's their story, I work for them. They'd killed other stories, as Al Pacino asked me, you know, was this the first time? It's not in the film. Um, the problem was this guy was not somebody who understood the media. He didn't have any financial resources. He was an upper middle class guy with a family with some health problems and a wife who was not, could not make a living, really and we were about to cut him loose. And they were, they didn't care. They didn't think about the consequences. When I brought this up with management people at 60 Minutes, they said, he'll take care of himself. Don't talk to him anymore. And so it was an ethical issue for me at that particular moment in my career. I had just turned 50, all our kids were out of college. Um, I lived in Berkeley, by the way, I always refused to move. So I always worked for people on the East Coast and stayed as far away from them as I could. Um, and so I didn't have really a personal excuse for letting this stand. And by the way, I wanted to say something else to that some of you who are in the business that, that the other thing that was going on in the background, I believe, one of the reasons why I survived that whole tobacco confrontation were issues and things going on that were a lot bigger than me in the story. In the history of the United States, no president of the United States successfully opposed the tobacco industry up to the point, up to 1995. Uh, Jimmy Carter was the only one who tried in 1978 and he backed down after they pushed back. They had tremendous political clout they were major campaign contributors on both sides and also in the states where they were important. But in 1995, Bill Clinton was convinced by Dick Morris, who's normally thought of in the United States as a conservative right-wing political operator, uh, who he had hired once before to help him in an election, that he was never going to get the support of the tobacco industry at that point. They were going to go straight Republican. So for political expediency reasons, he should be anti-tobacco, and he, he was. So we had a kind of, in the background, federal government that was leaning on the tobacco industry at just about that same time, around when there are all these lawsuits by the attorneys general and so on. Because otherwise, I think probably uh, 60 Minutes never would have run the story, and uh, a lot of other things wouldn't have happened. And I probably wouldn't be here today.
how to do investigative reporting when you have a country that's authoritarian and and how how can you try and get it done? Uh-huh. Right. Right. Well, there are, I mean, this kind of work depends, as I mentioned, on the country in question having some kind of tolerance of critical journalism or critical commentary. It's something that began in the United States back in the early 1700s with a guy named John Peter Zenger, who talked back to the governor general of New York and lived, got out of jail. In those days, they had a criminal libel statute, which many countries still do have today. Um, one of the encouraging things that's happening through collaboration worldwide is that there have been these international collaborations on various stories going on. In about four weeks, three and a half weeks, for instance, there's going to be a story released simultaneously worldwide done by hundreds of journalists working together on, well, I can't tell you what the story is. Um, but, but I can say this, there's a, another conference going on simultaneously about investigative reporting, starts tomorrow in Berlin, which is a, uh, was a, a spin-off from our conference in Berkeley. And it's focused a lot on encryption, security, and doing stories in those kinds of conditions. And so we do have the ability now to communicate and operate worldwide with virtual security in terms of encryption and communication. And the more partnerships that we can have, the more I've heard it from reporters here in Israel, the difficulty of reporting on certain subjects related particularly to the prime minister. So the more support we could give you in the United States, for instance, for doing that, kind of reporting is something that's more possible now and also possible in terms of the tools that are available to help ensure the security of the sources. That's, that's one of the big issues, by the way, that I think will be playing out over the next couple of years. In the Jeffrey Wigand case, we got lucky, he survived. Um, in many other cases today in the United States, the Obama administration well, it's gone very gently in terms of prosecuting corporate executives or corporations or very, the wealthy for their practices, usually making them pay a fine. Uh, the Sa Vegas Sands Corporation is likely to pay a large fine for violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act case, violations that, are, that were pointed out by Steve Jacobs five years ago. No one's going to jail. On the other hand, the U.S. government is spending a lot of money hunting our sources. And while James Risen uh, at the New York Times, a friend and someone who comes to our gatherings, um, was threatened with jail and a subpoena for a long time about the story he did related to the CIA and an operation in Iran, while the government decided in the end not to subpoena him so he didn't go to jail, they did put his source away, apparently, his alleged source anyway away and he's in, he's in jail. The government can now sweep up information in the United States related to journalists and use that to prosecute our sources if it involves, for instance, sensitive government information. And I believe corporate interests without, uh, on their own because of services sometimes that I've traced, by the way, back here to Israel that are available has, have attempted to identify our sources by investigating what goes on on the World Wide Web. Thank you. So